Hello and welcome to Triage, timely conversations for healthcare professionals, a podcast created and produced by KNL Gates. Each episode is designed to highlight important developments in health law and analyze the impact on our clients and friends of the firm. We hope you enjoy this podcast. Hi, and welcome to Triage. My name is Macy Flincham, and I'm an associate in the firm's Research Triangle Park office. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Don Walker, a partner in our Houston office. Don, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm looking forward to chatting with you today. Well, thanks for joining us today. On this week's episode, Don and I will be talking through some of the major questions that our healthcare provider clients are asking themselves as they prepare for implementation of the new regulations affected under the No Surprises Act, which was passed by Congress last year in an effort to protect patients from surprise medical bills and really to limit out-of-network cost sharing for patients receiving care from providers who are not in network providers participating in the patient's health plan. HHS outlined some additional requirements for providers in greater detail in an interim final rule released in July 2021, with such requirements to be effective January 1, 2022. So in response to these new protections um, for providers who are in network, the new regulations will require some advanced planning, particularly around ensuring adequate notice and consent requirements are met. So, Don, can you give us just a basic description of the new notice and consent requirements outlined in the interim final rule and when they would apply? Sure. So, maybe just to take a step back from that to reiterate something you said, you know, at a high level, the No Surprises Act prohibits healthcare providers and facilities from balance billing patients, except in certain circumstances. One of those circumstances is when notice and consent has been met. And so we have a lot of clients who are are working through how to operationalize notice and consent issues. As a threshold matter, the notice and consent requirements, they only apply when a provider will balance bill. So for the first question I would ask of our client is, am I balance billing? And if the answer is no, then notice and consent would not apply. Another category to which notice and consent would not apply are ancillary services. And in the interim final rule, they define what those are, and I I won't recite them here, but they're items such as services related to emergency medicine and anesthesiology. And one can think of those as items where a patient wouldn't have a meaningful choice to pick their provider. So then turning to when they do apply, I think it's helpful to think of those in two buckets. The first being emergency services. So notice of consent generally would not apply to emergency services except for post-stabilization services. So in the interim final rule, they have defined emergency services to include post-stabilization. And in that scenario, if an out-of-network facility or provider plans to balance bill, then they have to give the patient notice and consent. They not only have to meet the general requirements related to notice and consent, but there's some heightened requirements given that they're in a post-stabilization situation. And again, without going through all of those, one of those that may be uh, illustrative is that the attending physician has to determine that the patient can consent. The patient is able to be transported either through non-medical transport or non-emergency medical transport. For non-emergency services performed at participating facilities, there are notice and consent requirements for when a patient can consent. And the one thing that I would highlight just that I think people are having to work through is the timing of that. Because what the regs say is that the notice and consent has to be provided at least 72 hours before the appointment or the services are furnished. And if an appointment is scheduled within 72 hours, then it has to be provided at least three hours before furnishing the services. And I I know a number of trade associations have raised concerns about potential delays in treatment related to this. And so we'll see how the departments address that in any changes to the final rule, though I will note that they have previously said that one can provide the services without delay. However, those services are going to be subject to the balance billing protections. So let's say that a facility is in network for a given payer, but has out of network providers. Who then is responsible for providing notice and consent? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that we've gotten a lot. And this is an issue where a lot of facilities have concern. And to put a finer point on that, the facility's concern generally is if they're non participating providers at their facility do balance a bill 
and don't meet the requirements, is the facility potentially going to incur liability? And I think that's why they've been honed in on this issue. And I would say three things on this point, that a facility, they may agree to provide notice of consent on behalf of non-participating providers, but they do not have to do that. And that decision has potential liability impacts on the facility. So any agreement to take on that responsibility for the non-participating providers should be carefully drafted. Second, facilities should review their contracts with non-participating providers to see what, if anything, it says about balance billing, and then consider whether they should make changes to those contracts. And then third, again, trade associations have requested that departments be even more explicit on who has responsibility here. So uh, I think there's more to come when the, the final rule comes out. Okay, so Don, what about post stabilization services? Who then would be responsible um, for the requirements here? Yeah, and this is one that's, that I think has caused even more angst. And so when a in network facility has out of network providers, and those out of network providers are going to want to balance bill for post stabilization services, one of the requirements is that the notice must include participating providers at the facility who are able to furnish the services. So again, stepping back and thinking of the policy of this, they're, they're trying to give patients a meaningful choice and to understand their options of in-network versus out-of-network before they consent. So the regulation, in my view, is clear that the non-participating provider furnishing the services has to provide the notice. But there is some ambiguity here, and and we've seen, again, trade associations hone in on this issue and ask for clarity on it. And I will just say, as a practical matter, if out-of-network providers are, are going to balance bill for post-stabilization services, the facility is going to have to be involved for them to be able to, to meet those requirements, because I, I don't think that an out-of-network provider at a facility is going to know which providers at the facility are in-network versus out-of-network. So let's talk for a minute about reimbursement and the qualified payment amount. Can you describe how this may impact reimbursement um, and arbitration moving forward? So it's a good question. It's one that's caused concern in the provider community. And to maybe set the stage for this, a, a qualifying payment amount is the median contracted rate that an insurer has for the same or similar provider in the same or same or similar specialty. Where we've seen a lot of concern is particularly with hospitals. The departments have said for purposes of qualifying payment amount that all hospitals are in are in the same category. So there's not a separate category for a high cost provider like an academic medical center or a trauma center who generally are reimbursed at a higher rate because of the services they provide. So the, the reason the qualified payment amount is important on reimbursement, it, it really is a, is a cost-sharing mechanism that the insurer is calculating, but it, it becomes relevant in reimbursement because of the methodology for determining out-of-network rates. And that methodology, it would default to an all-payer model agreement or state law if it addresses the issue. More often than not, it won't address the issue. And so then when we go to the payer and provider's agreed-upon rate. So in other words, if it's an out-of-network rate, they're just going to have to agree on what's appropriate reimbursement. And if they can't agree, then it goes to independent dispute resolution. And in the independent dispute resolution, the arbitrator must give consideration to the qualified payment amount. So I think on the provider side, the concern is that the insurer in, in making a payment to them is going to default to the qualified payment amount. And then they'll have to challenge it in arbitration, and the arbitrator may be inclined to default to that median rate, and it's going to put a burden on high-cost providers who are, are reimbursed higher to, to really justify why they should be reimbursed at a higher rate. I know we're running short on time, but are there any other aspects of the interim final rule that providers should be aware of generally before the new regulations are implemented in January 1st? I see just a couple of quick points. For facilities and providers who are providing notice and consent, there are requirements for good faith estimates to go to the patient. There also are disclosure requirements where facilities and providers have to make disclosures related to balance billing, irrespective of whether they're balance billing. We didn't talk of those in, in depth, but I wanted just to flag those things as things people should be working towards and thinking about. And otherwise, I would just recommend that there be really close communication with the operational team and, of course, use of counsel as appropriate. 
Great. Don, thanks for the great discussion today. And thank you for listening. If you have any other questions about implementation of these requirements or questions about the surprise billing rule generally, please do feel free to reach out and we'd be happy to help. Hope you have a great day. Thanks again for listening to Triage, timely conversations for healthcare professionals. New episodes are available for download through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. By subscribing to Triage, you will receive timely notifications for each new episode. Also, if you have any topics you would like to hear discussed on Triage, please don't hesitate to email triagesupport at klgates.com. We would love to hear from you.